regardless of what words might be spoken, there would be no particular benefit unless at the same time there was an actual realized presence of God. In other words, <clears throat> the mere form of the message that comes through is not <clears throat> the important part of our meeting. And in the same way, when you meet <clears throat> to hear the tapes, it isn't of too much importance which message you hear. The importance will be the degree of realized Christ, of realized God, and uh, this must take place within your consciousness. Now, this brings up this morning another very important part of our work. <clears throat> Why are we really here? Why are we meeting here these Sunday mornings? Or what is the real purpose of your coming together in a class <clears throat> or hearing the classes? And on this point, you should be very, very certain the reason that we come together is to experience God. That is our function. We should never meet except for the specific purpose of experiencing God of having a spiritual realization because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In thy presence is fullness, fulfillment. And so anything less then the actual presence of God will not serve our particular purpose. Merely to know another approach to truth uh, will not do the work for us. It is true that we are fortunate in having the message of the infinite way as it has come through for this reason. The earlier writings and teachings on metaphysical and spiritual healing all came through in the earliest days of the revelation and at a time when the mental and the spiritual had not been uh, separated, had not been realized as two different states of consciousness, and also when certain principles were taught, which to the pioneers seemed right, and which later proved wrong. We've had the opportunity, not only of witnessing all that has taken place in these last 90 to 100 years, witnessing that which is and that which is not, we have also had the benefit of the 16 years of actual spiritual healing practice that I had before our first book was written and the 15 years that have gone by since then. So that with our books it should be easier to attain a spiritual consciousness and the realization of God 
than would otherwise be the case. But do not be fooled by this. There is enough truth in every one of the uh, metaphysical movements that are now on earth, I mean the major ones, for anyone, if they catch the message that's in them, to attain spiritual consciousness. And it is not the message that does the great works, it is the attainment of the spiritual consciousness that does it. I merely say that we have an easier time attaining it because of the nature of our writings. But it has been possible and is possible to attain it through any of the major uh, textbooks that are available. Now, if you realize then that the reason for your study of the writings, the reason for your hearing of the tapes, the reason for your attending classes, the reason for our being here on Sunday mornings is the attainment, the deeper and richer attainment of God awareness, you will have an easy, no, not easy, but easier approach to your daily living. Because once you perceive this point, you will know why you meditate. You will know why it is important that you start out your day before engaging in the world's activities with a period of meditation. And the reason is this. God-realization, the attainment of spiritual realization. Let us see how this operates in our lives. You hear the statement too often, nothing is impossible to God. And usually those that voice it mean, well then we just let God do all of this for us and uh, since nothing's impossible to God, we have nothing further to do. And you see, thereby, much demonstration is lost. Because it is true that nothing is impossible to God. That part of it is perfectly true. But that is not going to be of any help to you or to me. The fact that nothing is impossible to God, except in proportion as we can bring the presence of God into actual realization. In other words, it isn't the infinite all nature of God that makes our demonstration, it is the degree of our realization of that presence of God. There was just as much God in the world before the days of Jesus Christ. There was just as much of God in the world before the days of Moses. But what good did that all power of God do to the Hebrews until there was a Moses to lead them out of their slavery? What good was all of this infinite power of God until there was a Jesus to heal the sick and raise the dead and to feed the hungry. Spiritual healing was as possible to the world throughout all of the past 5,000 years as it is today. But 
of what avail was that to the world until Mrs. Eddy first revealed to us and to the world that the presence of God is as available in this age as it was on the shores of Galilee. In other words, the, the fact of God is not the important thing in the lives of men and women. It is true that God is and that God is infinite and all power and nothing is impossible to God. This is true. But remember this, that just as in the days of old, only men like Moses, Elijah, Isaiah, Jesus, John, Paul, only those who attained the actual realization and demonstration of God were able to do these mighty works of spiritual regeneration, spiritual healing, and spiritual supply. And this condition exists today, and it always has since the reintroduction of spiritual healing and spiritual living, that there have been and there are now some of higher attained spiritual awareness than others, and thereby there are those who are doing greater works than others. Now remember, the power of God is the same, and therefore the difference in demonstration is the difference in the degree of attained God realization. Once you know this, you will know that harmony in your individual life and in the life of your family or your students when you get to that point of having students, the harmony in their experience and yours is going to be in direct proportion to the degree of your attainment of spiritual harmony. I have witnessed this in these more than 30 years, that there are some homes, many homes, that are kept wonderfully free of the discords and diseases and disasters of the world, not always completely without some problems coming in, but on the whole, beautifully free of the world's discords and in harmonies, because there is a mother in the family devoting herself to spiritual awareness. Or in some homes there may be even a mother and a father. And where this is true, you find that household comparatively free of the disasters, the destructions, the discords and inharmonies of this world. Do not forget that this cannot be 100% demonstrated for the simple reason that we have not attained 100% of God awareness and to some extent the members of our household, just like the members of our student body, have their own responsibilities. No one can carry another wholly into heaven. One member of a family can do wonders for their entire family, but they cannot maintain complete freedom from discord for the simple reason that Every individual has a responsibility toward their own spiritual development, and you cannot usurp that. You cannot take from them the privilege of going their materialistic way if that is the way they wish to go. 
You cannot take away from them the, the uh, uh, individual expression of their own lives, even when their lives differ from the spiritual. And therefore, do not believe for a moment that you can guarantee complete immunity from discord to all of the members of your household, because you cannot. But you certainly can assure that probably the major disasters and destructions of life will not come nigh your household. And certainly, in a great measure, you can keep yourself free. Now, the measure of this freedom from world discord is proportionate to your attainment and the degree of your attainment of God-realization. And as you know, meditation is the most important factor in the development of that consciousness, and especially when that meditation is backed up with your understanding of the nature of these principles. And I want to illustrate that for you. If you go into meditation with the idea that you are going to bring God to the destruction of sin or disease or lack or limitation, you are going to set up a barrier and prevent the very thing you are hoping for. And so it is that in approaching meditation, you must realize this. Evil, regardless of its form, does not exist as a power. It does not exist as an entity or a force. Evil whether it's in the form of sin or disease or lack or unemployment or wars or threats of wars, exists only in the same nature that darkness exists. Darkness is not an entity that goes somewhere when light is admitted to a room. Darkness doesn't go any place because actually there is no such thing as darkness. Nobody has ever seen darkness. Nobody has ever felt it. Nobody can analyze it because there is no entity called darkness. Darkness is merely an absence of light. The moment light appears, there is no darkness. But darkness did not go any place. It hasn't moved out of the room. It wasn't in the room. There wasn't any it. There was merely an absence of light. As you perceive this, you understand the function of meditation and spiritual healing. Meditation has for its purpose admitting the light which is God, letting loose the light that is within you, releasing the light that is stored up within you, the kingdom of God, that is, spiritual light, is within you. And we must open out a way for the imprisoned splendor light to escape. Therefore, meditation has nothing to do with overcoming sin or disease or lack or unemployment. 
Meditation has nothing to do with stopping evil men from continuing their evil practices. Meditation has to do with you as an individual realizing and releasing the light that is within you. In the attainment of that, the darkness disappears. And the darkness is any and every form of human discord. The darkness and its forms vanish the very moment light is introduced. In other words, we do not know how to heal disease, but we do know how to sit and realize the impotent nature of anything other than God's presence. Thou couldst have no power over me unless it were given thee of God. There is no power to darkness. There is no power to the forms in which darkness appears. Sin or disease or lack. So therefore, we are not here to fight these. We are not here to overcome these. We are not here to destroy any of the evils of this world. We are here that I may realize that I and my Father are one. That where I am, God is. And that because of God's presence, there is peace, harmony wholeness, completeness. The place whereon I stand is holy ground. For in the presence of God there is the light of truth. Thy presence is my sufficiency in all things. Thy presence, thy grace is my sufficiency in all things. To know God aright is life eternal. To realize God is to realize freedom, complete release, from fear. In thy presence is fulfillment. And I am here in meditation to realize this truth and to be a transparency so that the kingdom of God within me may be released in consciousness, thereby dispelling every appearance of darkness, every appearance of discord, inharmony. If I realize and feel the presence of God, everyone in this room receptive and responsive to God feels it and feels the effects of it. Every time, every time that you in your home attain in meditation an awareness a feeling of God's presence, 
You have released the light into your home, and you will find there are no dark places there anymore, no hidden errors, no sins, no diseases, no lacks. For where there is light, darkness does not abide. Where there is spirit, there can be no forms of mortality. Thy presence is my sufficiency, thy grace the realization of thy presence. I in thee and thou in me, like every branch of the tree, one. I have meat the world knows not of. I have within me this realization of God. I have within me this realization of a divine presence, of a spiritual light. And this is my bread and my meat and my wine and my water. This is the law unto my life. This is the presence that goes before me to make the crooked places straight. I need not voice it. In fact, I must not voice it. Pray in secret, and the Father that seeth in secret will reward thee openly. In secret, realize God's grace. God's presence. In secret, realize the spiritual nature of the function of God. And then, in proportion, as you feel an inner awareness, an inner release, an inner confidence, you can be assured that you have attained some measure of light, of spiritual light. And then you go about your daily tasks, whatever their name or nature may be, and leave the rest to that realized presence of God. Now because of the nature of what we call this world that we're living in, we have been told by the Master to be in the world, but not of it. And so this means that unless you were a few hours later to sit down again for a meditation, you would soon find that you were again embroiled in this world and its fears and its discords. Just uh, a couple of days ago, something came to my attention, I think it was in a paper, that bore witness to the evil nature of some of these men that are manipulating the world. And uh, for a moment it brought a sense of inner disturbance and almost at the same moment the voice spoke and said, but there aren't any evil men. Man is spiritual. And there was a complete release from being in the world, or being of the world, of being under the influence of its fears and uh, its worries. And you may ask, 
Did that remove these evil men from the world? No, merely from my world and from the world of those who are attuned to my consciousness. It definitely took them and any effect that they might have from my consciousness and from the consciousness of those who are attuned to my consciousness, and I can only be responsible for my own state of consciousness. So with you, you need not ask the members of your family to believe in uh, spiritual healing or spiritual living. You need not try to sell them on the idea of what benefits they could receive from it. It is far better to accept responsibility for your own state of consciousness and leave the rest of your household to work out their unfoldment. And if they are to be brought to this, rather by your example than by your preaching. This does not, however, extend to the children of our household, for remember that we are responsible. By having children, we have accepted the responsibility for their care, their instruction, their government until they have reached the age when they may go off and live their own lives. But remember, they usually will go off and live their own lives in accordance with what they have received primarily in their homes. Now, your function in your morning meditation and at the other meditations during the day or night will be the realization of God's presence. Remembering this, you do not have problems to overcome. You only have to attain the realization of God's presence and it by being the light, will dispel the darkness. And not dispel it by overcoming it or destroying it, but by proving that in the presence of light there is no darkness. And you will demonstrate that in the presence of God there is fulfillment. There is no sin no disease, no lack, no unemployment, no war in the presence of God. And if you were at the very battlefront, there would be no war for you in the presence of God realized. Now, your only responsibility at this stage of your unfoldment is the development of your own spiritual consciousness. At first this may seem a bit selfish to leave the rest of the world alone and concern yourself only with the development of your own consciousness. But you will find that this particular form of selfishness is the height of unselfishness because once you attain some measure of God realization then the world will be the pathway to your door and really be benefited by the degree of consciousness that you have attained. No one can be benefited by coming to you as a human being. I mean benefited spiritually. They can only be benefited by coming to you in the degree of your attained spiritual realization. And therefore, it is the height of unselfishness to let the world alone temporarily 
while you study, meditate, attain a measure of Christ realization, and then every time a call is made upon you, answer it and fulfill yourself. Answer it. Do not have the fear that you do not yet understand enough or that you haven't enough spiritual power because there never will come a time when you understand enough and there never will come a time when you have spiritual power. All that you can do in your most advanced state is what you can do in your beginning state and that is let the light dispel the darkness let there be light and there was light let there be God and God functions the presence of God goes before you so when called upon when you observe discords and inharmonies in your home, this is an opportunity to begin your practice. And your practice consists of meditating until you feel that presence of God and then let it perform its functions. So eventually, as the light dawns more and more in your consciousness, you will find that others will come to you. At first it'll be a miracle how they even knew that you were interested in spiritual things. I think this always puzzles us, how people discern without even knowing. And as they come, do not send them away. Accept the responsibility. If God sent this individual to me, then it is only that God may respond. And so I will meditate. And your whole responsibility is to feel that inner assurance of God's presence and let it perform the work. Always remember, you are not responsible for saving somebody's life. You are not responsible for healing somebody, for you do not have this capacity, nor does anyone else. But you do have the responsibility for being in this world, but not of it. You do have the responsibility of retiring several times a day for your meditation for the realization of God's grace as your sufficiency, as God's presence, as the light which dispels the darkness. And then abiding in your meditation until you feel this presence and then let it perform its work. You are not trying to reform people. You are not trying to heal people. You are not trying to change the conditions of this world. You are sitting in meditation to attain the realization of God's grace, of God's presence. That is your only function. And in proportion as you succeed, you will witness how the darkness evaporates out of your life, out of the life, out of your household, out of the experience of the members of your household. And then gradually, how this darkness is dispelled in the experience of those who come to you. But let us not go back to the To at least to some of the principles of the earlier days of the metaphysical teachings, do not let us go back to what has not been successful and uh, let us work toward the higher revealed 
principles and uh, yes, unfoldments or revelations. Just as an illustration, in the very earliest days of metaphysical teachings, there was a teaching to the effect that uh, rheumatism was caused by uh, this state of consciousness or another. Cancer was called, caused uh, in people who hated or who were jealous and uh, all of that kind of thing. Every physical disease had a mental cause. Well, now I must tell you that within the, the first uh, five years of Mrs. Eddy's own practice, she discovered that these principles were entirely erroneous. And uh, she recalled every one of the lists that she had given out to her students with these mental causes for physical diseases. And unfortunately, one of her major students refused to give up his list, and he has perpetuated in his teachings, which are widespread, uh, this very teaching of a mental cause for a physical disease. The result of that is that this list got into all of the other metaphysical movements that came later, unity and new thought. And as a matter of fact, they are now included in uh, the teachings of psychology. And yet, as long ago as 1880, they were proven to be erroneous, fallacious. Yet they persist to a great extent in the metaphysical and psychological consciousness of the world. Now, should you ever be tempted to go back to such erroneous practices and beliefs, try to understand that they never were successful, aren't successful now, and none of the movements founded on them were successful. And then you will know that you had best eliminate anything and everything of such a nature. You see, evil does not have its existence in the consciousness of any individual. Nobody causes their own problems except in one way, and that is through ignorance of truth. Every problem that we have in our experience is the degree of our ignorance of truth. In other words, evil has a universal source, what Paul called the carnal mind, or Mrs. Eddy called mortal mind, human consciousness, any name you want to give it. But it is absolutely impersonal. And therefore, the very first principle that started the message of the infinite way was this one, that evil does not have its rise in you. Later it was also discovered in this message that evil does not have its rise in God and all of the religious teachings of centuries that God is responsible for acts of evil, for the diseases or the deaths of human beings, that God calls home human beings. All of this has been outlawed in the message of the infinite way, every bit of it, because it has come as direct revelation that no evil has its rise in God. God is not responsible for any of the evils that have befallen mankind. And then secondarily, neither does evil have its rise in individual you or me. 
all evil has its source in the universal belief in two powers, in the universal belief that we are a selfhood apart from God, in the universal belief that there are laws other than spiritual laws, the laws of God. In the degree then that you begin to purge yourself of the belief that any of the evils in your life or human life emanate from God, as you go a step further and realize that none of the discords of life have their rise in man whose breath is in his nostril, but that every evil of any form of any nature, even tidal waves, even winter storms, all of these things have their rise in the carnal mind, which is merely a belief in two powers. Without a belief in two powers, nothing could ever be destructive. Nothing could ever be harmful. Nothing could ever be painful. And so we have as the basic source of all evil the universal belief in two powers, this constituting the mesmeric suggestion or mesmeric mind or mesmeric belief that in the end manifests itself in our bodies and in our business and in our affairs. Once you turn in meditation and realize evil does not have its source in God, evil does not have its source in man, evil, the darkness, is really made up of a belief in two powers. And this belief has no law of God to sustain it. It has no divine authority. Therefore, it is without form and void. And then turn within. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. When thou utterest thy voice, the earth melts. Therefore, in this meditation, I am a transparency. That thy will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now listen to that one. Just listen to that one. That thy will may be done on earth as it is in heaven that thy will, and remember we've just acknowledged that thy will does not include acts of destruction, sin, disease, death, that thy will, do you want to know what God's will is? Read the Gospels and see why Jesus came to earth, what his mission was, and the source of his mission. And you will find that the will of God is that you be healed, that you be enriched, that you be fed, that you be raised from the dead, that you be enlightened. That was why he came to earth. That's why he gave this message. I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have life more abundantly. And this is the will of God. Therefore, when we pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we mean that health, wholeness, harmony, peace, abundance, all of these be made manifest on earth as they are in spirit spiritual reality as they are in the kingdom of God within me. As Browning says, there is a center within each one of us in which is complete harmony, 
complete spiritual rest and peace, a complete Sabbath from this world. There is that center within each of us, and in our meditation, eventually, we reach it, and we actually sit in that center within our own being. We sit there in an eternal peace, in a divine state of peace, and the storms of this world do not enter there. And we are praying that this eternal peace at the center of our being, this eternal harmony, wholeness, completeness, perfection, be now made manifest on earth as it is within me. And therefore, if I have within me this center of divine peace and rest and Sabbath, and I meditate, it is only that I may be still and let this imprisoned splendor escape so that you may feel the divine presence and power that is at the center of my being and which I have realized. This, in turn, reveals to you, since it is true that God is no respecter of persons, that this same divine center is at the center of your being, and you can retire from the world in a meditation, be separate and apart from the world, be in the world, but not of it, and finally realize that you too have meat that the world knows not of. You to have this center where peace is enshrined. You too have this inner center of light. And therefore, it is possible for you to open out a way for that imprisoned light to escape. And as you do, be assured, the storms out here begin to subside. They may at first be only the storms that are in your own mind and body. Later, they will be the storms that are in your household and in the members of your family. And then later, you will draw to you those to whom you can give the same light. Do not be discouraged if you cannot benefit all whom you would like to benefit, because you must remember that there must be some degree of re spiritual receptivity and responsiveness in those who you help. Usually the mere fact that they will ask for it indicates that they have that degree of spiritual uh, receptivity. but. My mail shows how many people there are writing to me to please take up work for Jones Brown Smith somewhere, who isn't interested in spiritual truth and is in a hospital or is receiving medical aid, but they deserve to be well. Oh, they are a loving mother or a loving father, and they deserve to be well. As if we could go around entering the household of anybody and everybody who is sick. We can't. But surely we can bring some measure of light to everyone open, receptive, and responsive to it. And that is our responsibility. Eventually, by this light, you will find that more and more in the world are receptive to it. And that is the reason we have every reason to believe and to hope that we are rapidly approaching the age of harmony in world affairs. Don't anymore be discouraged by the day-to-day -day news 
then eventually you will be when uh, healing the sick or treating the sick and finding that for a while they get worse or that they don't improve you will come to see that that is no uh, cause for discouragement as long as you are doing faithfully the work that is yours and uh, that your patient or student is faithfully doing theirs because all healing work does not evolve in the same way. Very often healings do not take place until some specific truth has been realized or some specific uh, discord or other has been removed from our consciousness before the harmony can appear on the body. In other words, never judge by appearances. All you are responsible for is the degree of your meditation, your attaining God-realization, and then the government is on its shoulder to perform its work in its way. Just as when the Master says to the woman taken in adultery, neither do I condemn thee, but go and sin no more. In other words, my responsibility only goes to bring about this immediate release. Your responsibility lies in attaining the higher consciousness that will prevent this recurring. So it is then that as we come together in any or every phase of our work, let us realize this that deep at the center of our being there is this enthroned Christ, the light of the world. Within me, within you, there is this light of the world, that which can save the world. The Savior of mankind is enthroned within you. And you are going into meditation for the purpose of being still and realizing I have meat the world knows not of. And in this meditation, this light, this meat, is to be released. go out into this human consciousness as light, dispelling darkness. And so now we'll have a period of meditation for that purpose. And you will notice how that everything connected with us with our room, with our tape. Everything will carry forward. I'm trying to think of that uh, Bible passage that even if I didn't speak, the very stones uh, would cry out. And so it is that even though we do not humanly voice this truth, even though we sit in silence, the very walls will emanate light, give light and comfort and healing. The very robe that the Master wears will carry healing power. And so our meditation now. Good morning. Last week, before we ended our meeting, I suggested a little exercise for this week, 
And I'm wondering how many were able to consistently work with it through the week. Oh, that's that's a lot. That's a lot. And uh, did you have experiences with it? Was it beneficial? Now, the reason that I ask this is this. I hope you really believe that ten righteous men in a city could save the city. I hope you really believe that uh, 100 people in this world could save the world from all of the disasters that threaten it. Just 100 people or less could do that. Because we have seen how one individual could influence the lives of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. One individual like Moses could influence and benefit the entire Hebrew race of his day. One man like Jesus Christ could influence and benefit millions of people for 20 centuries. And probably his, uh, the benefit of his work will benefit more from now on than even up to this present time. Think of how the life of Mrs. Eddy has affected the entire religious world throughout the globe. And think how many millions of people have experienced physical, mental, moral, and financial healings through that one woman's consciousness. And if you stop to think of that, then you must realize the power there is in one individual spiritual consciousness. Of course, you could multiply all this. Remember, I, I'm only, for brevity's sake, I'm only mentioning a few, but you could go all the way back to uh, Lao Tzu and to Buddha. And you could come all the way up to modern times and take in uh, the Fillmore's and uh, so many others whom you could name who have influenced the lives beneficially, who have blessed, who have brought peace and harmony. And so, as you read the lives of the religious lights of the world and see the influence that every individual one of them has had on countless thousands and sometimes millions, you will understand what I mean when I say that ten righteous men can save a city, a hundred righteous men and women could save really the entire world. And so we come down to uh, the question, what do we mean by righteous? What do we mean by ten righteous men? It has nothing to do with people of good morals. It has nothing to do with people of... Uh, uh, what we call religious aspects. The word righteous has to do with attained spiritual consciousness. It has to do with actual developed spiritual consciousness. The same uh, mind that was in Christ Jesus. The same consciousness that has influenced all spiritual lights. Some of you know, and I would like all of you to know, that the same spirit that animated Lao Tzu and Buddha was the very same spirit that animated Jesus Christ. And the spirit that animated Jesus Christ is the self-same spirit 
that has animated every spiritual light, male or female, throughout all time. In other words, there is only one spirit, and there is only one spiritual consciousness. And that same spirit that performed its work through Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jesus, John, Paul, that same spirit is the spirit of every individual who attains spiritual consciousness. In other words, they attain the consciousness of the same spirit that has animated every spiritual light. Therefore, it has the same power. It has the same influence, and it always does the same miraculous works. Now, the major function of this spirit as it operates as individual spiritual consciousness is to break the attachment of the human mind to forms and effects. In other words, it acts as a law of non-attachment so that the effect of the operation of the spirit is that an individual loses their fear of the destructive elements of human life and they also lose their love of those things that temporarily seem good but which eventually are destructive. In other words, it destroys the love, hate, and fear fear of external appearances, external powers, external laws. An individual who attains some measure of this spirit is enabled to say, what did hinder you? Pick up your bed and walk, realizing that there is no power in the effect, no power in an external condition. In the same way, an individual who has attained even a grain of spiritual consciousness can enjoy the things of this world, but never be attached to them, never be willing to lie for them, or steal for them, or cheat for them but always willing and able to enjoy them as they come into one's experience normally, harmoniously, without loss or injury to another. And so we come to the major question then, how is this consciousness attained? With all of my reading, and with all of the unfoldment and revelations that I have received, I have found only one way, one way that has been known throughout all the ages and has been taught throughout all of the ages. I'm not speaking now of the first uh, experience which is that of divine grace, which comes to certain individuals without their uh, knowledge or without their preparation on this plane. They probably and undoubtedly have been prepared by previous lives. But as you examine their lives on this plane, you cannot understand why it is that one individual here or there by some act of the grace of God, has attained a spiritual consciousness that they have not deliberately built. But these experiences are rare, and these individuals are rare. For the most part, spiritual consciousness is developed. 
as for instance the uh, twelve disciples of the master none of those received it by a divine grace as the master did each one of those attained it through the instruction of the master and evidently an obedience to the teachings that he gave them in uh, the same way <clears throat> that many have had the experience of sudden illumination some even in their childhood and uh, then gone out to become teachers and sometimes religious leaders but their students their disciples and their apostles had to learn it had to develop it had to work with it and it is because of this that we know there is only one way this one way is divided up into several different approaches but it is always the same way and I will illustrate that for you in uh, the Hebrew Testament we read thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee and here we have one of these approaches keeping the mind stayed on God keeping the mind stayed on God will eventually bring about a spiritualization of consciousness the degree of that is determined by the degree of keeping the mind stayed on God another passage from Hebrew scripture is lean not unto thine own understanding acknowledge him in all thy ways and he will give thee peace rest and here again watch as if you were going to use that particular passage watch what would happen to you as you allowed yourself to think lean not unto thine own understanding relax don't don't try to struggle for an understanding or to use your own knowledge acknowledge him acknowledge God in all thy ways all right acknowledge God in all thy ways I acknowledge that I couldn't wake up in the morning if there weren't the presence of God to awaken me or I would certainly not awaken healthy happy joyous if it weren't that the presence of God made itself felt I acknowledge that this is the day the Lord hath made and this is the day in which God governs this day and therefore my activities throughout this day are under the government of God under the jurisdiction of infinite intelligence of divine love therefore I cannot be capable of anything this day except which would be a showing forth of God's wisdom and God's love and here you would see what would happen to you as you went through an entire day in that way leaning not on your own understanding for whatever it is you're to be called on to do but remembering always that the presence of God in you is your wisdom your intelligence your love the presence of God in you is your safety and your security and your inner peace the presence of God within you is the cement in all of your human relationships in other words it is that spiritual bond that exists between all of us there is only one thing that keeps us at peace in this room 
There's only one thing that keeps a relationship of love between us. Only one thing that keeps a spirit of sharing between us, and that is the presence of God. If it weren't for the presence of God, we would be about 75 individuals, each one living his own life, each one responsible only to himself, each one not caring for the other, each one not sharing for the other, each one concerned only with getting, receiving, achieving. But the presence of God in our midst changes that entire relationship to one of sharing, one of communing, one of helping each other in whatever way the Spirit may direct. In other words, we can always maintain a spirit of love, a spirit of harmony, a spirit of peace and prosperity among ourselves merely because of our continued recognition of the presence of God in the midst of us. Now, we can go forth from this room and carry that same spirit with us by the same means, taking these two Bible passages and living with them, moving with them, having our being in them thereby exemplifying a passage of the Christian scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, every spiritual truth. And you see the use of those first two passages is a fulfillment of the third. In other words, by living with the first two passages, we would now demonstrate and prove that we are no longer living just by means of our salary or the food we eat or the families we have, but now there is another factor that has entered our lives, and that is a spiritual grace which has come about because of our living with every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Well, it would only be a short time until, actually, you can't help a smile coming to you when this passage all of a sudden comes into your thought and you understand it. I have meat. The world knows not of. Doesn't that make you smile now when you think of what the Master meant? I live not by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that word of God, which I am entertaining in consciousness, <coughs> now becomes my meat and my drink, my substance, my staff of life on which I can lean. Oh, you see that scripture really fits into a pattern once you begin to understand that these passages of scripture were given to us for the purpose of developing that spiritual consciousness or testifying to what happens in the life of an individual when they have attained some measure of that spiritual light. There are several of the Hindu religious teachings which have a practice that they call Ramnam, R-A-M-N-A-M. And it means name of God. And the practice itself consists of a continuous repetition of the word God. An individual from waking in the morning until sleeping at night repeats over and over and over just God, 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 God. To such an extent 
that even when they are conducting business, even when they are uh, reading or studying, regardless of what they may be physically and mentally doing, there is a little area of consciousness back there that is repeating over and over and over again, God, God, God. In other words, they are keeping alive in them the conscious recognition of the presence of God. There is, however, a fault with that, and that is that if one isn't careful, it, the repetition of the name can become hypnotic, and a person can really believe there is some power in the word God. And uh, I have witnessed this too often, that the whole of reality, the whole of the world disappears from some people who attempt this because they get hypnotized with just the repetition of a word. There is a mystical Russian order that has the same uh, premise, only they take it in a different form. They have a short prayer that is called the prayer of Jesus. And they repeat this prayer of Jesus over and over and over again, not only hundreds of times a day, but thousands of times a day. No matter what they're doing, there is an area back here in which this prayer of Jesus is being repeated and repeated and repeated. And again, in spite of its good quality, it has the drawback of becoming hypnotic, of actually hypnotizing a person to the extent where they're not thinking it anymore. It's really become a part of the subconscious uh, activity and begins to lose its effect. But the purpose of it is good, the same as the purpose of Ramnam is good, because it is the same purpose that we have in the use of our scriptural passages. Only with the use of our scriptural passages there is no possibility of any self-hypnosis taking place or any mesmeric sense because we do not fasten on to one particular word or passage and uh, let it become hypnotic, we take the circumstance as it may arise in our day's experience and bring to conscious remembrance a particular passage that may apply to that situation. In other words, there is nothing now hypnotic or mesmeric or, as the Master warned against, uh, vain repetitions in this. In this, it is more on this line. If a particular problem presents itself to me that at the moment seems a little difficult, I can bring to conscious remembrance he performeth that which is given me to do. He perfecteth that which concerneth me, and I can relax in that assurance that there is a he, and that if I'm just still, that this he that is within me will supply me with the answer to this problem, or even do more than this, work it out for me. In the same way that at times we are presented with problems that have to do with time and space. And uh, immediately we know that I and my own self could never accomplish this with the time that is at hand or with the space that is involved. And so we call to conscious remembrance the truth that there is a space spiritual presence that goes before me to make the crooked places straight. The spiritual presence is not confined to time or space and therefore can be instantaneously in any part of the globe at the same moment that I am thinking 
that this presence goes before me to make the crooked places straight. We come sometimes to uh, legal matters, matters which have to do with courts. And here too, we remember instantly that justice and truth are not qualities of man, but of God. And for us to look to man whose breath is in his nostril for justice, for equity, for truth, for love would be, well, it would be an error, it would be a sin because we have no right to expect truth from man. We have no right to expect justice from man for these are qualities and properties of God Therefore, if we are to go into a court of law, let us go in with the realization that God alone is the source of justice. God is the source of law. God is uh, the means and mode and activity through which and as which truth and love appear. Then we find that these qualities come through a judge or jury or witnesses, whereas left to man whose breath is in his nostril, they could very well be withheld. So it is, you see, that uh, we, on the, uh, on the very opposite of being hypnotized by a statement, we are always alert for a particular truth for some particular facet of truth that will apply to this particular situation with which we are faced. Now, the sum total effect of uh, this practice is to spiritualize the consciousness of the individual engaging in the practice. In other words, with this practice and with each use of this particular form of work, the consciousness of an individual changes to where ultimately there is left in them no fear, no hate, and no love, no attachment to the forms of life, but there is now a breaking of all sense attachments. And don't misunderstand this. It doesn't mean that you lose your love for your family or your sense of obligation to your country. It doesn't mean that. It means that you are completely free of the undue influence of the emotions you are free of the undue attachments that we humanly form so that ultimately we become so passionately fearful, hateful, or loving that all reason is thrown aside and we become victims of our own emotions rather than uh, having dominion over everything that is on this earth or above it or beneath it. You see, the object of spiritual consciousness is the attainment of our original God-given dominion. We were not meant to be victims of hate or fear. We were not meant to be victims of love. We were meant to have dominion over these things so that we could handle each emotion as it arose, we could handle each situation as it arose, and not with venom and not with partiality, but with the justice that is not of man, 
but which is of God. The master clean, plainly indicated that he was not sent here to be a judge over anybody. And one of the acts of spiritual consciousness is to free us from sitting in judgment. And once we have been released from sitting in judgment, we are able to see the situation as it is and deal with it intelligently. Now, just the practice of the one Bible passage, the place whereon I stand is holy ground, is really enough to remove from us tons of fear, because no one can possibly fear when they're standing in the presence of God. I mean, that would be an utter impossibility. We would need no words. We only need the assured feeling of the presence of God, and fear would depart, even if we were in the lion's den, even if we were loose in a rubber boat on the ocean, even if we were lost on the desert. If we had the conscious presence of God, fear would depart. No circumstance in life could frighten us if we were consciously aware of a spiritual presence. Now, think as you work consciously with the passages of Scripture. Note how they are used in my writings and see how they exemplify every healing principle. See how they are brought into use at each instant where some opposite thought or emotion might be, in comes this Bible passage to release us, to free us, to give us release from what the Master called this world. He says, ultimately, I have overcome this world. And I can tell you from experience that whatever measure of this world that we overcome, we will overcome through our spiritualized consciousness and a consciousness that we can attain with the use of these scriptural passages. The only other way that is known today of releasing a person from attachment to this world is what in the Orient is called the guru system. In other words, finding a teacher who is himself or herself released in some measure from attachment to this world and spending some time in their consciousness. That contact alone often brings release, brings Christ realization to students. But we do not have this system in the Occident. We do not have it because we do not have teachers equipped for it. But we do have a means of attaining this release ourselves. And that is in just this way that I am describing to you today, which really is the method that is employed throughout the entire infinite way teaching. As you read again, any of the books that you have, or hear again any of the tapes, you will note that the entire message evolves around scriptural passages. Each passage is given and elucidated in some way so that the passage itself 
can bring a release or an awareness. When we repeat often as we do, thou couldst have no power over me unless it were given thee of God, do you not see that the only purpose there is in bringing that to conscious remembrance is that we may also see that whatever the pilot is in our particular life, some disease, some sin, some false appetite, some person, some condition, that we too may instantly bring to remembrance, thou couldst have no power over me, unless it were given thee of God. In other words, only that which is ordained of God is power. Only that which emanates from God, only a law that comes forth from God is power. When we realize that, and we're faced with material laws, mental laws, legal laws, we can then say to any of them, Thou couldst have no power over me, unless it were given thee of God. Unless it is ordained of God, you have no power. Only that which is of God is power. You find that this practice brings you ultimately to a release from the fears, from the doubts, from the situations, and in the measure of your release have you overcome this world or some facet or phase of this world. When you study well the four Gospels and note how touched the leper. You have to ask yourself, how dared he, in the face of the belief in those days that this was the deadliest of diseases, how dared he, because he had overcome the fear that there is any external condition that can bring harm to my experience. He had overcome the fear that there was any power in anything external to himself. Even on the subject of food, you remember, he said, nothing that enters the mouth defileth. Nothing. It makes no difference what food you're eating or even if temporarily you have a bit of poison food, don't fear it, because it is not what goes into the mouth that creates the issues of life, but that which comes forth from our consciousness. In other words, as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And if you persist in fearing the things of this world, if you insist in unduly loving the things of this world, they're going to react upon you. That's because it is an emanation of your own consciousness. In the degree, then, that you are not controlled by fear or by love or by hate, but are controlled only by your realization of the presence of God, in that degree do you find as Paul found, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Now, you are reading in the papers, you're hearing on your radio, uh, the threats that are coming at the world from so many different directions, but the question is whether or not you as an individual are hearing it merely as a bit of recorded day-to-day -day history, or whether you are permitting it to excite in you a fear. Whether you are listening to it and saying, none of these things move me, I'm merely 
seeing history instead of reading it a hundred years from now. But remember that a hundred years ago people were going through the same experiences that we are today. They were experiencing what we are reading. And if they could have experienced them in the same way that we can read them, as if they were just passing shadows in time and space, they would have found their freedom from them as we can find our freedom from them. None of these things move me. Why? There is a grace of God in operation. There is a grace of God, and this grace of God is molding every situation on earth today. We are evolving, and we have been evolving from the caveman days to the days of our present civilization where most of the responsible people on earth no longer wish to resort to the use of force to settle the arguments of nations or of individuals. And even industry is preferring the uh, table for settlement to the courts. And so you find in every way that there is an invisible force operating to free this world from its discords. But this invisible force is not something that operates of itself because it would have freed mankind centuries ago. This force operates by virtue of what is taking place in individual consciousness. In other words, there is nothing up here in time or space that is making our association with each other harmonious, loving, just, free. Nothing. There's nothing operating in time or space to do that. Whatever is operating is operating in your consciousness and mine. We in this room have agreed, even though we may not have done it consciously, we may never have made the statement to ourselves, but actually we have agreed that in this room we put up the sword. We check our revolvers at the door as we come in. Even our mental weapons we check. And we come in in a spirit of grace, in a spirit of love, in a spirit of cooperation, in a spirit of receiving something from the Word of God, the consciousness of God, the Spirit of God that is here. And that is what makes this relationship we individually have accepted this relationship in consciousness. Now, our function is not merely to set up a group of people on earth who prove that they can live harmoniously together. Our function is to prove that the development of spiritual consciousness is a freedom to the entire world. And by virtue of the degree of our attained consciousness that we help to bring about non-attachment to the rest of this world. So it is that each of us goes out of here into a home or into a business, into an art, a science, a profession, but we must carry with us this consciousness of the presence of God, this consciousness of one power, so that whatever environment we may find ourselves in, we are consciously declaring within ourselves there is but one power functioning here, and it is the power of love, the power of spirit, not the power of my human love for anybody, 
this isn't great enough to remove a headache but the power of the spirit of love which is of God operating here in my consciousness is a law of freedom unto your consciousness and wherever you go you go with that recognition of keeping your mind stayed on God so that God may be the cement in the relationship wherever you are. Now, as you review through uh, your reading, as you review the consciousness of those individuals who have become spiritually imbued and remember that this is exactly the measure of the power of your consciousness in life you have within you the same spirit the same mind that was in Christ Jesus as long as you are keeping your mind stayed on God as long as you are acknowledging God in all your way and therefore wherever you go you are a benediction you are a blessing to any individual to any group to any meeting and by the power of silence not the power of speech you know one of the saddest experiences that we meet is in uh, associating with those who have some metaphysical and spiritual background one of the saddest ex experiences is to hear them mouth these great words of truth these great passages of scripture and you know to me this is a very irritating thing in fact sad and the more the longer the student has studied and the further advanced they seem to be the more horrible it is when I hear them voicing these sacred passages of truth and of scripture instead of holding them locked up tightly within themselves until they're called upon to share them with someone who wants them not voice them for the purpose of showing how much they know not voice them to those who cannot possibly have an interest in them or understand them but who can keep them locked up in the way the master taught pray in secret and then what the father seeth in secret will be shouted from the housetops if you know any truth keep it locked up within yourself make it secret prayer sacred prayer unless the opportunity comes when someone asks for spiritual wisdom then share what you have and be loving enough to share it simply giving milk to the babes and meat to the advanced but remember that you do not show forth the degree of your understanding by how much truth you voice but how much silence you can experience it is only in silence that the works of the spirit are accomplished that is why a silent treatment is much more powerful than an oral treatment an oral treatment is apt to hit up against the consciousness of an individual and bring out rebellion in other words you say to a person in pain oh disease has no power and you can almost feel them bristle as they say no I wish you were suffering this and so your statement has not only not blessed anyone but it has antagonized and it has been a barrier to their healing whereas had you voiced anything at all outwardly along the line of 
I'd love to help you. I'll pray. And then in your silence realized God alone is power, you would have aroused no mental reaction from your patient, but there would have been some measure of receptivity to it. You will find that in healing work or in your human associations, in your office, in your school, in your business, that if you never voice your spiritual convictions, but keep them locked up and uh, spiritually realize them silently, you will be a tremendous influence wherever you are. Whereas by voicing it, you not only arouse antagonism, but you arouse some suspicions as to your sanity. And rightfully so, because almost every spiritual truth is an insanity to the human mind. Scripture recognized that when it said, the things of God are foolishness unto man. And just think how many of our metaphysical and spiritual students go around mouthing these wonderful spiritual truths into the human ear to whom they are foolishness, to whom they are insanity. Yes, yes, I have even in my mail found a student saying to a doctor, oh, you know I know this disease isn't real. Doctor's a very fine man to tell that to, I'm sure, spending his entire life trying to prove the reality of it. But think, think only what a power we could be if we could learn the value of silence, an outer silence, but not an inner one, inner one knowing the truth, inwardly keeping the mind stayed on God, inwardly bringing to conscious remembrance all of these tremendous passages given us by such great masters as Christ Jesus. Think if we were to live, and some of the Hebrew masters, think to abide with them and let these be within us. It would be like the title of our new book. There would be a thundering of silence. The silence would thunder throughout human consciousness. And, as I so well know, only silence is power. Even, even when words are spoken in teaching, if they are to have power, the only reason they have power is because of the silence that went before and the silence in which they are received. In other words, I learned this right from the beginning, that if we come to a meeting having a, a goodly period of meditation in a silence, and if I go to the meeting after a period of inner silence, we both come with power to give and to receive. But it's only because of that period of silence, which is like a vacuum into which we are inviting the Spirit of God to enter and the Word of God to express itself. Only in quietness and in confidence do we find this peace. Only in quietness and in confidence does a treatment function. A treatment does not function through a mind that is in fear of the condition that's being treated or the person who's being treated. A treatment can only function in silence, in stillness, in inner peace. And that is why only those should be engaged in the work who have found some measure of inner stillness and inner peace. Because the words themselves are not power. It is the consciousness through which the words come that is the power. And that consciousness is a consciousness of stillness, of silence, of inner peace, and of an inner grace. 
And so it is that we are going, first of all, to take another passage with which to work for this week, and uh, then we are going to have, after the machine stops, we're going to have another period of meditation in which to contemplate whatever passage is now given to us. passage will be, I am with thee. I am with thee. And you'll see instantly that as we walk along the street or drive, we first of all have the feeling of just being there alone, just ourselves. And this makes all of the responsibility on our shoulder. But as we consciously bring to remembrance, remembrance, I am with the, the shoulders can drop back a little. A relaxing can come, I am with thee, walking along the street or driving in the car, or up in the plane or down in the submarine. Wherever I am, I am with thee. I am. That I am is God. Infinite power, infinite supply, divine love. And just to know that I am with thee is enough to ensure that every need will be fulfilled at every moment. I am with thee. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is fulfillment. And so to know that I am with thee is the spirit of the Lord, the consciousness of the presence of God. I am with thee.